Okay, let's look at an example. And this is an example of what I call brute force circuit analysis, where we're going to take all those techniques we just looked at before, Ohm's law plus KCL plus KVL, and in this case, we're going to use it to find a voltage in the circuit. Let's find V2, the voltage across this 2 ohm resistor. And this is just given to us, this particular voltage. It's, we're simply said, what is that voltage given that polarity? What's V2? All right, so we're going to find that, and we're going to do that by step by step using all of the steps we did before on the previous problem and write all of our equations. So, first of all, first step, let's identify all the nodes. How many nodes are in this circuit? Well, in this case, I've got one node here that connects these three elements together. Call that node one. Then I've got a node here that connects the 4 ohm resistor to the 10 volt source. That's node two. And then I've got one node here on the bottom that connects the 2 ohm resistor with the current source and the voltage source. And that's node three. So three nodes by inspection, one through three. Okay, next step, let's define our branch currents. So are there any branch currents in this circuit that are undefined? Well, the one amp is, not, is de clearly defined, so I don't need to write anything there. But what about the current through the voltage source and those two resistors? Those are not. So let's go through and let's define those currents. So in this case, for the two ohm resistor, I've already got that, two, that V2 voltage defined. Why go against that? I'm going to define that I2 current following the passive sign convention. Now here, for the 4 ohm resistor, I'll just kind of arbitrarily pick a direction for that current. And in this case, I will call that I4. And then I'll pick a direction through the 10 volt source, call that I sub S. So I4 and I sub S were basically picked arbitrarily in terms of their direction. All right, so I've got I2, I4, I S. Next step, let's define our branch voltages. All right, so in this case, looking at this, the V2 voltage is already defined. There's no point in me defining a new branch voltage for that 2 ohm resistor. Over here, I've got this 1 amp current source. I'll call that VI, so I'll define that unknown branch voltage across that current. And then for the 4 ohm resistor, I have to follow the pass the sign convention. Call that V4. The 10 volt source, I already know what the voltage is across this element. It's given. It's 10 volts. Therefore, I don't need to worry about it. And therefore, I now have VI, V4, and V2 is given. So V2 is already given for us, and we just used it as given. All right, next step. I've done all my definitions. I've defined all of the unknown quantities in the circuit for each element, for each branch. Now let's go through and let's write our equations. First, Ohm's law. Now 
Let's write Ohm's law for each resistor. And in this case, V2 is equal to 2 times I2, R times I. And V4 is equal to 4 times I4. So two resistors, two, two Ohm's law equations. Next step, let's write our KCL equations. We need KCL for each node. There are three nodes, and let's go ahead and write those for node number one. For node one, one amp is flowing into the node. Keep in mind, the node is everything. It's this entire region, not just that point. So one amp is flowing in. I2 and I4 are both flowing out. So one amp is equal to I2 plus I4. For node number two, I4 flows in, IS flows out. I4 is equal to IS. And for node 3, IS flows in, I2 flows in, 1 amp flows out. Those are my three KCL equations. But note, if I take I4 equal IS and I replace this I4 with IS, then 1 and 3 are the same equation. So it turns out I've got three equations, but just as we saw before, only two of them are linearly independent. Okay, now I need to write KVL for each loop in the circuit. And here's where things get interesting. So in this case, for step six, let's do KVL for each loop. The question though is how many loops are there in this circuit? There are three. One loop, two loops, and then a loop that goes all the way around the perimeter. So actually we've got three loops here. So I'm going to call this loop A. I'm going to call this one loop B, and then going all the way around the perimeter I'm going to call that loop C. So actually there are three loops. And so in this case, if I go through and write my equations for loop A, I, I, normally when I work these problems, I usually like to just start in the lower left-hand corner and go clockwise. Just me. But that's the way I normally do it. You can pick any place, any starting point, go clockwise or counterclockwise. But I just like lower left clockwise. So I'm just, that's, what, that's what I'm going to do here. So for loop A, VI is the rise, V2 is the fall. So VI is equal to V2. For loop B, V2 is the rise. Then as I travel around clockwise, V4 is a drop. And then the 10 volts is a drop. So Rise negative to positive, drop positive to negative, drop positive to negative. And so therefore, for loop B, we have that V2 is equal to V4 plus 10 volts. And finally, loop C. Let's start here. Loop C, travel around, and then I've got VI is a rise. 
and that's equal to V4 plus 10 as the drops. And then that comes back around to the starting point. So I wound up with three loop equations. Once again, note that only two of these are linearly independent. If VI is equal to V2, I can swap and that equation becomes that equation. So this expression here, or this statement here, is also true for the set of, pardon me, this is KVL, not KCL, pardon me. I think I said KVL, but I should have written that. So now I get the same result for both cases. I get two linearly independent equations for both the KCL and the KVL equations. Okay, now I can solve. How many unknowns do I have? Well, let's check to make sure we actually can get a solution out of this. The unknowns are VI, V2, I2, I4, V4, and IS. So those are the unknown quantities in my circuit. Three unknown currents, three unknown voltages. I solve, and if I do that, what I'm going to get is the following. And once again, I'm assuming we're going to solve by Mathematica. And I want to emphasize that on any exam, that's all I need to see. Write the equations and say, Solve by Mathematica, or Mathematica gives this, and then just write the answer. So in this case, I'm plugging all those equations in, and what I will get is that I2 is equal to 2.333 amps. I4 is equal to minus 1.333 amps. IS is equal to minus 1.333 amps. V2 is equal to 4.667 volts. V4 is equal to minus 5.333 volts. And V1 is equal to 4.667 volts. And there's my answer. Okay. I can now go through, if I want to, do the power check to verify it's correct. You can check that for yourself, but I can assure you it is correct. And here is the V2. This is the quantity we wanted. But Mathematica just gives you everything. It solves for everything simultaneously. So you just pluck that answer out of everything else that it gives you. OK. Now, this worked. But you know, we had a lot of equations. We had six equations. Think what would happen if I added another loop, another connection from here to here. I'd have a loop there, then a loop here, then a loop there. And quickly I would find that the number of loops and the number of nodes starts multiplying very, very quickly. So this works. This is called brute force analysis. It works, but it's not very elegant. OK? So the problem with this brute force analysis First of all, you have to have a separate voltage or current variable for every element, unless it's given. Unless it's in, if it's not known and specified, every element has to have the other unknown, uh, the, the other unknown written down and solved for. So I need separate voltage and or current variables for every element. So that's problem number one. Problem number two, I need a separate KVL or KCL equation for every loop and for every node. So 
So this is a problem that literally had four components, and yet I had to solve six equations. And if I added a few more components, you'd find the number of equations begins to explode. So brute force works, but it's not elegant, nor is it simple, and it becomes very easy to make a mistake. We need some analysis shortcuts. We need a way of taking this technique and cutting out some of the equations, making it simpler. How do we do that? Well, next time we'll figure out what those shortcuts are. We'll show you some examples of what we call series and parallel connections to see how these shortcuts work.